science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. It is going to be a busy week, so I am recording this early, both for, you know, our week is going to be really busy, both for good and sad reasons. Um, I have been asked to present to the Vancouver School District about science education, which is really cool. But on the heels of that, on Sunday is the memorial for my mom. We hadn't really talked a lot about it in the podcast. We spoke about it online, though. Um, but in the summer, at the end of May, early June, my mom got a freak brain infection and she didn't recover from it. It was it's it's still really hard to believe that she has died. Um, and uh, this weekend we are having a memorial for her. So even though the science podcast, we try and keep things about science and empathy and cuteness, it is a family show. And that big, big life event is affecting us all this week. Fun times presenting to the Vancouver School District. That's going to be very cool. And it's such an honor. And then um, really tough day, really tough weekend to get through. What's on the show this week? In science news, we're going to look at the success of of the DART mission. That was that <laughs> probe that NASA chucked at an asteroid slash comet to see if they could save us from disaster. In pet science, we're going to look at something that Dr. Zazie Todd wrote about in Psychology Today, and that is the three things that dog and cat owners are doing really, really well lately. So some good news. Our guest this week on the Science Podcast is Murray Burgess, who's an urban ecologist. Hey dogs, do you know why mocking birds sometimes doesn't turn out the way that you think? Well, things get really unpheasant and awkward. <laughs> okay, that one's so bad. All right, on with the show, because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, okay, let's chat about the success of DART. We may have spoken in passing on the science podcast about DART, and DART is, DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, and it is a refrigerator-sized probe slash satellite um, that smashed into the asteroid Dimorphos and changed its trajectory. Now, the whole idea was to see if we had the ability to alter the orbit or the trajectory of something with a man-made device, like an interplanetary defense matrix. <laughs> and DART did hit the target, and it smashed into the target going like wicked fast, 22,500 kilometers an hour. Now, that is very, very fast. It should be noted that Dimorphos and Didymos are not on a collision course with Earth. We don't need to get Bruce Willis on the horn to assemble a ragtag group of oil riggers to take out an impending planetary disaster. As NASA said, and quoting NASA, the experiment was a smashing success. So these two asteroids are orbiting each other. So the idea was if they smashed into one of them, you know, hard enough, would that affect their orbit around each other? When we're talking about how huge space is, if something's on a collision course with Earth, if you get to it soon enough and far enough away and you just nudge it a little tiny bit, it will miss Earth by a huge margin, even if you move it by a fraction of a degree. So they were checking to see if the impact changed the orbit of these two asteroids around each other. And originally they orbited each other every 11 hours, roughly 12 hours actually. And after the impact, the or orbit was shortened by about 30 minutes. The impact of the dart did change the orbit of Dimorphos. The photos of the impact are just amazing. Like, um, I believe this little thing detached from dart, um, uh, 
called Licka Cube. <laughs> Let's called the Licka Cube. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's the light Italian CubeSat. So it kind of like hopped off the Kamikaze satellite so it could uh, basically take images of what's going on and then monitor what's going on with the asteroid, right? So they didn't want to lose all of the tech in the explosion. And the photos are amazing. You can actually see the like the <laughs> the dust and the ice explosion in outer space. Now, you might not think 30 minutes of a change of orbit is a big deal, but NASA had a goal of just over a minute. So if they change the orbit by about 70 seconds, that would be considered a huge success. And because the orbit was changed by 30 minutes, everybody was super, super happy with how this panned out. Now, while this worked this time, if a large enough asteroid was coming towards Earth, it's not like you could send uh, something out like right now to stop it if it was going to hit us within a couple months. This would have to be planned years in advance. So that's why it's there's two arms of this planetary defense, like combing the night sky for big giant rocks that could kill us. And also the technology to just boop boop them a little bit to change their, their death trajectory. I forget who said this, but it's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's a good thing that we spend money on this. Like it, it, it seems like it's a silly thing to send a very, very expensive piece of technology smashing into an asteroid. But just remember the dinosaurs spent zero dollars on planetary defense. And how did that turn out for them? <laughs> go dart, go NASA, go space science. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's keep the good news a rolling. So this comes from Psychology Today by one of our favorite guests ever, Dr. Zazie Todd. And she wrote about three things that when you analyze the work and the literature that humans that have dogs and cats are getting right. There are some things that we're not getting right, and uh, there was a big discussion, I guess, in psychology today about that. But I wanted to talk about the things that we are doing correct. So Dr. Zazie Todd writes, learning more about cats and dogs. That's something that as a group of cat and dog owners, we're doing well. 50 or 60 years ago, the dog or cat wasn't studied the same way that it is today. The average person didn't really care as much about a dog and a cat, like the actual behaviors and psychologies and the science. I, I find now, of course, the, the, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> so you're listening to the science podcast, which mixes pets and science, but I find talking about all of the, the cool science that I've learned from doing the show and talking to experts. When I talk to pet owners, they can't get enough of it. They are hungry for more information. And by and large, that's something that pet owners are doing well. As a group, we're keeping up to date on the newest research. We're seeking out good information for the wellness of our dog and our cat. There's a lot of, of course, bad information out there or outdated information. So, you know, you do have to be careful where your sources come from. I would probably recommend Dr. Zazzy Todd, for example, um, and then other people we've had on the guests. We vet the guests to make sure whatever they're talking about, of course, is, you know, it's got some uh, rigor behind it. We're not just bringing people off the street, as well as the amazing dog trainers that we've had on. Their record speaks for themselves. So good job, everybody. We're learning more about dogs and cats. The second thing that everybody's doing a lot better about is training pets with rewards. So that's positive training instead of using punishment training. It wasn't that long ago, and I remember watching, I don't want to name the guy, but there was a very, very, very popular show that when the dog was doing something that it wasn't supposed to, there was a little bit of violence and, and there are people that still train dogs with choke chains and shockers and slaps and scares and, and, and aggression. And that was the common way a while back to train most dogs, but that's not happening anymore. Most dog owners are using reward based training methods. Not everybody, but it's become mainstream. 
It's not like if you said, you know what, you shouldn't do that. You should, you know, if they're doing the right thing, tell them they're a good dog and give them a quick treat or use clicker training. Because (laughs) I think 20 years ago, if you told people that, they'd look at you like you had a second head. Now, cats, cats can also learn positive reinforcement. I have Ginger coming and sitting and she sits for photos. She sits better for photos than Beaker sometimes. So positive reinforcement also works for cats. Good job squared, everybody. We are treating our pets with respect and how we train them. Now, the third thing that everybody is doing better at with dogs and cats is doing activities that dogs and cats really like to do. And that's enrichment activities for their pets. More people are walking their dogs. It is it is way more common now for a dog owner to just know that you're supposed to walk your dog for half an hour to an hour every single day. Where in, in you know in the past people would just like leave them tied up in the backyard. That still happens and it's heartbreaking. But most new dog owners, the majority are like, yeah, you need to walk the dog every single day. Also, people know about like snuffle mats or Kongs or frozen food and treats and things like that. Um, Teaching your dogs to do pet tricks. Or if you have a working dog like a Border Collie, finding a club that does herding. Everybody's doing a better job at finding activities that their dog likes to do. What activity does your cat like to do? Well, people are doing great there too. They're buying enrichment toys to play with their cats and getting different types of catnip and catnip-like plants for their cats to enjoy. So this would be cubed, not squared. Good job, everybody. Cubed. I want to thank Dr. Zazzy Todd for always being a bright light of positive dog and cat science on the internet. Um, We'll link her article in Psychology Today in the show notes. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I'd let you know how you could help out the Science Podcast. The Science Podcast will always be free to download. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But here are some ways that you can help us out. Number one, check out the merch store, www.bunsenburnerbmd.com. The merch store has adorable gear, the beaker stuffy, and now text from Bunsen. Number two, think about joining the Paw Pack community. It's going to be replacing Patreon, so thank you Patreon supporters. But if you aren't part of the Paw Pack, we'd love for you to join. Our new community will take what we do on Patreon and supercharge it. There's going to be so many cool perks to joining the Paw Pack community. Look for it in the next couple weeks. Third, think about reviewing the Science Podcast on a podcast player and giving us a great score. It really helps. Back to the interview. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I have Murray Burgess with me today, who is a urban ecologist. How are you doing today, Murray? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? I am so good. I'm very excited to talk to you. Um, Our account has been following you for a while, and we love your posts and um, you've got a really cool profile picture on Twitter. Uh, where where are you calling into the podcast from? Where are you in the world? Oh, thank you. I am in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, okay. All righty. There's, there's lots of people who love birds from the Carolinas that we've spoken to on the podcast before. It's a good place to go, I guess, for birds. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> um. Could you tell everybody a little bit about your science training, just so people get have a little background about what you do with ecology or what your training in ecology is? Yes. So I always had an interest in animals. So my background is in wildlife, uh, fisheries, and aquaculture. That's okay. where I got my undergraduate degree in at Mississippi State. And I moved straight to North Carolina State into a PhD program in wildlife and conservation biology. Oh, congratulations. So you're working on your PhD. Yes. Started my fourth year. Oh, wow. That's so cool, Murray. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> I, I didn't get past <laughs> my undergrads. I've got two undergrads and uh, my wife went and got her master. So I know how much work graduate work is. And then to just pursue a PhD is, I have a lot of respect for those folks. That's a lot of work. So. Thank you so much. It is a lot of work. 
that you mentioned you loved uh, birds or you loved science when you were younger. Were you a kid that was out in nature all of the time or were you a kid that read a lot of books? What was it about science that grabbed you when you were young? I was a nature documentary kid. So oh, I was yeah? always <laughs> watching like Animal Planet and like the Crocodile Hunter and shows oh. like that. I didn't do a whole lot of naturey things. I um, went to a lot of zoos and aquariums as a kid. Mm. So that's kind of where my love came from. Awesome. Did you ever uh, pretend you were like a narrator when you were like outside? You're like, <laughs> see there, there's a, there, there over there is a dog, right? Like, so I don't know. If Absolutely. I ever did that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're biologists and they would pretend to be the narrator from the shows they'd watch on the BBC. Yes, that's absolutely how I spent a lot of my free time. <laughs> <laughs> were your parents or were your parents or your family um, concerned or were they like, she's going places? <laughs> I don't think they were concerned. I think they were pretty excited that I was oh. into something. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> now, through your through your uh, research, you've been looking at songbirds and types of pollution. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that that area of your research maybe something that folks would find interesting or might right. blow, blow them away a bit so i focus on what's called sensory pollutants and mm -hmm. so i guess most people think about like regular pollutants like air pollution water pollution but sensory pollutants are more often things like noise and light and what it does is either blocks an organism's senses so that they can't sense a cue or it misdirects an organism's senses, so they're following the wrong cue. Oh, okay. And and how did how did you get even decide that we should be something you'd look at? Yeah, the field of urban ecology actually is really new compared to the study of ecology as a whole. Mm. And I just felt it to be a really pressing issue, especially. Um, growing up in like suburban urban areas, like light pollution is everywhere. Hmm. That's a good. Did you grow up in a big city or our town to experience this as a, a younger person? Yes. What I would call big, I guess, maybe hmm. on the outskirts of cities like Jacksonville, Florida, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, areas like that. Oh, right. Well, there, there'd be lots of light pollution there, even from the bigger cities you'd see in the distance, probably. Right. Hmm. So what did you find from your research? What's, uh, wh well, what birds did you look at, I guess? So right now I'm looking at barn swallows okay. and I have actually been running a field experiment testing how light pollution affects their chicks as they grow up. Mm -hmm. And so far I'm finding that the chicks that grow up in light pollution, they fledge from the nest faster, but they end up overall smaller. And does, what does fledge mean for uh, folks like me? Um, I'm covering for myself. <laughs> what, yeah. is, what does fledge mean? Is that like when they leave, like they go away, they get kicked out? Exactly. They <laughs> It's when they grow enough flight feathers that they're able to fly away from the nest. Right. So like 18 year olds, once they're done high school as humans would fledge away from the home. Exactly. Though they don't. <laughs> Many of them have feathers, but anyways, <laughs> um, what made you study uh, the the barn swallow? What, what what was it about that bird? Was it just the one that's around? Was it convenient, or did you have some some other reason? Both of those reasons. Okay. So the first is that it's a pretty global species, mm. and light pollution is a pretty global issue. So it made mm. sense to like pick a species that would experience light pollution in many places. And then the second reason is that it is really convenient um, for barn swallows nest in a barn. So like I just needed the structure to hang up some lights and like actually run the field experiment. Oh, OK. You had to go talk to a farmer and you say, hey, I'm going to mess with your barn swallows for a bit. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Were they OK with it? Yeah, I thought it was but... cool to have a scientist on their site, actually. Yeah, people were really interested and they were excited really? to have uh -huh. these barn swallows. <laughs> Did they, you know, mo I live in rural Alberta, Canada, and most farm families would live, uh, if a scientist was on your property, they'd be like, hey, come on in for lunch and here's some coffee. So I don't know if you got some of that hospitality from checking out your 
your equipment? Definitely a little bit. <laughs> they always seem like super busy on the farm. Oh, yes. really cool. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. So this research, I guess, is ongoing. Um, is this part of your PhD? This is. I mm. still have a lot of data to input and analyze. <laughs> right. So yeah. if it turns out that light pollution is like not great for birds, what the heck could we do about it? Well, the easiest solution is, of course, to like turn off the lights. Like that is something that like most people are able to control. All you have to do is flip a switch. It saves you energy, money. But also there you can't turn off lights in every single area, right? Mm. Some people are worried about like safety or you actually need the light to see. So another thing we can do is change the type of lights that we're using. Um, how, how so? Yeah, for example, you can use LED lights, which is better for like energy and like not giving off as much heat. Mm -hmm. And you can also use red colored lights, red or yellow colored lights, because the the spectrum that they give off is not as harmful as like a white light. Really? Yes. Who, how did, wh I'm just perplexed. Why would it be? Is it just something to do with how it affects animals? I don't know. I believe so. I think it affects the way that they perceive the light or like how intense the light is to their eyes. And it disorients them way less than a full spectrum oh. white light would. Okay. Hmm. Because I know uh, there's there's a couple places in where I live in Alberta, Canada. They're called dark skies, but that's more for um, astronomy. But they like reorganized everything in the town to keep it as dark at night as possible. Um, yeah, dark skies are amazing. And I have seen them a lot for astronomy, but they are incredibly helpful for birds and all wildlife as well. Yeah, I can imagine it wouldn't just be birds that would be annoyed or detrimentally affected by uh, <laughs> A giant halogen bulb somewhere. Hmm. Right. Yeah, it affects a lot of animals. Hmm. I would imagine, like, would bats be affected by that? I believe I so. But, you know, there are always some unintended benefits. Like if a light bulb is drawing a bunch of insects, that's like an easy meal for bats and even certain oh. bird species. Oh. But that's terrible for the insects, you know, they're getting <laughs> just decimated. <laughs> well, as long as it's mosquitoes, I could do with a heck of a lot less of them things. <laughs> I feel that. So big picture after this, after your study with um, these with barn swallows and I, you, you are you're close to probably finishing your PhD, like in the next couple of years, I'd say. Do you have any future plans, things you want to look at, or, or, is it, or is your research right now all encompassing? Yeah, so I hope to be able to continue with the urban ecology kind of route. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm really interested in knowing is my current study only focuses on the chicks, and as soon as they leave the nest, like I'm mm -hmm. done measuring them. But I would love to be able to do a recapture study and see if the light pollution has a long-term effect on the chicks. Oh, like uh, weigh them or something, like something yes. quantitative? Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, like after a year or so, recapture them, weigh them, and see if they were able to catch up, so to speak. Right. Because hmm. currently you don't, you're kind of hands off with the birds, right? Or do you have to, ca do you have to catch them, the ones in your study? I do. I'm hands on. I take them oh out of the nest and take them to like my little table and I have a different instruments like weigh them measure them take their wing length and <laughs> all kinds of different stuff it's They're like probably a little... not super happy about that no <laughs> <laughs> not at all wait so does that bust the 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 myth then that if you touch a baby bird it's mom mama's gonna abandon it then it does birds really don't use their sense of smell it's really a more of a visual and audio cue that prompts a mother to care for their chicks. So the smell of me on the nestlings isn't going to deter the mom. 
Hmm. I see. I believe that was even an episode on community in one of the last seasons. Yes. Have you watched community? Yes. I love community. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> One of the last seasons, uh, Abed and the older gentleman with the amazing voice. I think they like. Yes, they wanted to the raise the bird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, what was that guy's name? He had such a cool voice. Anyways, off topic. That's what happens on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Well, we'll keep we'll keep uh, checking your profile as uh, as this research rolls along. Um, and uh, of course, if you. You know, if you ever do ha- get to publish it, let us know and we'll augment it with some uh, some posts. Absolutely. Yay. Now, I, uh, Murray, I want to talk to you a little bit about the books that you've written. Um, not everybody ha- is an author or has written books. We just finished our ebook, Text from Bunsen, and that was a huge amount of work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> could you talk to us a little bit about your books that you've written? Yeah, so the first book that I have is called Why Wolves Howl. That one was self-published. You can find it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And that one's more of a fictional story about a wolf becoming friends with the moon. But I wanted to write a story like that because it's stories like that that inspired me as a little kid to start Mm -hmm. loving animals and wanting to work with animals. So it's... it's, uh... Is it based on reality or is it like a children's book? It's um, a children's book, um, okay. com- completely fictional. <laughs> uh, the animals are very animated and act like more like humans would act. I got you. And it looks like you can get this on um, Amazon. So is that is that where it was published? Yes, through Amazon self-publishing. Perfect. All right. We'll make my, sure. Oh, go oh. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, but my second book is going to be like more professionally published. Okay. Um, I have a children's nature series coming out under Little Brown Publishers. What? Uh, Yeah. The first book is going to be called Sparrow Learns Birds. And it's going to be about a little black girl who loves exploring her neighborhood and learning about the different birds in it. And she'll teach the audience how to identify common backyard birds by sight, movement, and sound. That's adorable. Congratulations. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so are you working with an illustrator? Because um, I'm, or, or are, you, are you secretly a, the artist as well for this? Oh, no, I am not artistically (laughs) gifted. (laughs) I am working with an illustrator. Her name is Tamisha Mm -hmm. Anthony, and she's fantastic if you go check out her work. Oh, my goodness. We'll have to. Um, When is this is not out yet, but it will be. Yeah, not out yet. We are expecting it to be out by about this time next year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it takes (laughs) as someone who's been through the process of writing a book, it takes a long time. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) And our book was not, um, our book was a bunch of the compilations of text from Bunsen from Twitter. So just collating them, updating them and getting that all done. That took a huge amount of work. So props to you <laughs> and other Thank authors. You. Yeah, it's, it's been a long process, but I'm still super excited about it. And this will be in uh, through this company through in bookstores or is this online only? It'll be in bookstores. Oh, nice. Cool. So if I go to chapters in a year, I might find it there. You might. It's super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have to take a bunch of selfies with it. and then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. I can't wait to do that. <laughs> so we have a couple standard questions on the podcast and uh, they're fun ones. We get to know our guest a little bit more. And uh, the first one is for our guest to please share a pet story with us. We ask all of our guests on the podcast to share a pet story from their life. And um, do you have one to share with us, Murray? I do. So I have a dog. His name is Loki. He is, yeah, he's a three and a half year old pit bull mix and Mm -hmm. he lives up to his name. So I take him to the field like all the time when I'm working with the barn swallows and he just becomes this huge goofball. So anytime I drop something, he'll just take it and run. 
I call him like the worst field tech ever because he's just like so <laughs> disruptive to my scientific process. <laughs> so he is lives up to his name of the trickster god, I guess. He does. Yes. Have you ever done get help with him? <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> that could be a fun trick to teach him. <laughs> uh, you got the reference. So for people that maybe did not get the reference, that is from Thor Ragnarok. I believe Thor chucks Loki into people. Uh, <laughs> to distract them or something. He uses Loki as actually a weapon. Um. <laughs> yes. Um, he go ahead. Oh, I was going to say he had me worried one day because he was not responding to me calling his name. I hadn't seen him running around in a little while. And I was just like searching and searching for him, getting worried. Mm -hmm. And I decided I'm going to get in my car and drive down the road, see if I can see him. And as soon as I get in my car, he's just there in the back seat, chilling, <laughs> just wondering why I'm freaking out. It's like, I'm just taking a nap. <laughs> he's like watching you run left and right, kind of like some yes. some 1920s comedy with the, you know, silent era. Hmm, what's that happening over there? Yes, I was like, you heard me. <laughs> Um, is Loki a hit when you go out and about on your different experiment journeys? He is. People love Loki and Loki loves attention from people. So everybody's happy. Um, is Loki good with birds, though? He is pretty good. Um, I do try to, like, shoo him away, you know, tell him to leave it or else he might get a little bit too curious. Um, he just doesn't know his own size. He's like hmm. 60 pounds, but thinks he's six pounds. So a big lap dog, if he can make it. Yes. <laughs> um, I we If I was in your boat as a ecologist doing research with birds, I don't think I could bring Beaker because she is such a, a huge prey drive for birds. I don't know. I think she would probably eat some of them if she could. Um, <laughs> that would be a disaster. Bunsen would be good to bring because he'd be curious and then he'd go right to sleep. Like, <laughs> yeah, that would be an awesome, awesome yeah. dog. <laughs> What are you doing? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, sleep time. <laughs> yeah, Loki's prey drive is more so for squirrels and rabbits. He's pretty oh. good with <laughs> Yeah, Be Beaker has a prey drive for anything that moves. It's um <laughs> the hunting line in her from being a golden retriever, I guess. Yeah. Is uh is Loki going to make an appearance in one of your books? You know, I hope he will one day. I do have some story ideas even surrounding him or like with him in the background. I yeah. Hope he will. <laughs> Talk to that illustrator and have Loki make a camp a cameo in one of your one of your up, upcoming illustrated books. Yeah, that would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Live on forever in the hearts and minds of children that read it. That'd be pretty cute. Yeah, so be adorable. <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing your story about Loki. Um, I love that when dogs' names sometimes live up to things that they are perhaps named after. Um, so it would be really, really possibly disappointing as the interviewer if Loki didn't live up to being a bit of a trickster. So, <laughs> Yes, I believe he even tricked me because he was like totally calm for like the first two weeks I had him and then his personality oh. just exploded. <laughs> he's like I, I gotta be really quiet and really good or this lady might get rid of me <laughs> exactly and then and then once you fell in love with him he's like aha gotcha <laughs> he was playing all along this is long yeah playing the long game <laughs> well, i love that story um the next standard question is uh a question about the super fact it's something that you know that when you tell people it blows their mind a little bit um could you share a super fact with us? Yes. Throughout my research, my super fact is that it is possible for birds to get diabetes. What? How? What? So birds already have like a super high metabolic rate. They can they need more blood sugar than humans do because they fly. But it is quite possible that light pollution might drive up their blood sugar levels even higher than what they're supposed to be. 
and just like us, that can result in metabolic diseases like diabetes. So obviously there's no birds flying to some bird doctor for insulin shots. Is that the end of the bird? We don't know yet. Um, Hopefully it's a case of if they can move away from the light pollution, they'll be able to better regulate themselves. But light pollution is such a prevalent issue. It's like, where are they going to go? I'm a little stunned. I don't know what to ask. I didn't even know that was a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a pretty shocking fact. It would make sense, though, because like all animals that have blood probably have a form of insulin regulation, right? Um, Right. I don't think insulin plays a huge role in birds, but I'm not entirely sure like what mechanism, what element or whatever is really controlling the process. That's 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 part of what I'm looking at. That's so fascinating. (laughs) I just assumed... I just assumed, um, like, I don't know anything about biology because I'm a chemistry person. Um, that is, I'm going to, I'm going to look more into this myself. You've piqued my interest. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. And that's kind of part of my project too. Like hoping to kind of figure out more of those mechanisms and like why light pollution can drive up glucose. Hmm. You know, if any bird was going to have trouble with sugar, it would be the hummingbirds. (laughs) Yeah, it would be. I feel like they're just like hopped up on sugar all the time. Yeah. All of the nectar drinkers. Yeah. yeah, That would be it. Yeah. (laughs) Like if somebody, if somebody had insulin problems as a human and they just decided to drink nectar all day, that'd be the end of them. I think their glucose would spike. uh, (laughs) Rough go. (laughs) Yeah. It might not be a good situation. (laughs) Well, um, thanks for the, the super fact. That's pretty good. You You know, it's a good super fact when you've made the host like actually have to ponder things that they thought were true. (laughs) I'm glad I delivered for you. That, that, that brings like other questions. Like if birds could get diabetes, Mm -hmm. dogs get diabetes, like dogs get, that's a thing that people talk about all the time on our account. We have followers that have to be really careful with their dogs and diabetes and I wonder, like, because birds aren't mammals. They're a different thing. They're like the aves, right? Um, Right. Yeah. Weird. Okay. Well, okay. Um, I'm going to keep getting, I'm going to be a stunned banana if we stay too long on this. So let's, let's move to the next question. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Now I'm over here wondering, wait, can snakes and like fish or can other organisms get diabetes? could Could a reptile get diabetes? Yeah. What about like a what about like a mosquito that sucks the blood of like some seven year old kid after Halloween? Now I need to know the answers to all this too. Because that would be <laughs> syrupy, syrupy quality bl- blood after Halloween. <laughs> were you did you were you the type of kid that binged all of your Halloween candy, or did you like strategically stretch it out as long as possible? You know, my parents strategically stretched it out as long oh, as possible. If parents. it was up to me, I'd probably eat it all in a couple of days. <laughs> make yourself super sick. Yes. <laughs> did you have to pay any parent tax with some of the stuff you collected? Like, Absolutely. You remember, yeah. What did you? What did you remember losing? Like, what did? You, what did? What was the tax thing that you lost that you would have wished you could keep? keep oh that taxes for like snickers m M&M, <laughs> stuff like that the chocolatey things like the, the, the good little mini the mini ones hey yes yeah um i'm as a dad and now my kids are older now so they don't do halloween anymore um i love tootsie rolls do you have those in the states the uh, things called tootsie rolls yeah ones? we do i love and the only i can only find them at halloween and my kids hated them so oh, my tax, no. yeah, my tax was I would just take those that they hated. Um, and they're like, yeah, sure. Take all of the Tootsie Rolls. They were happy to be rid of them. So hmm. yeah, I always love the Tootsie Roll lollipops. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they like those. It was like the little candy things. Um, oh, yeah. By themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Off topic again. Um, the last section of the podcast is called the important to you second section or the important to you using a pun. 
And we asked our guests to share something that they're passionate about. It could be a hobby or cause. You wanted to talk about inclusivity in um, like bird birding and field research. Yes. So um, obviously your listeners can't see me. I am a black female and doing this type of work that I do, I'm usually one of the only black people or people of color doing it. So yeah. I am really passionate about inclusivity, making field work and just nature spaces safe and accessible for anybody who's interested in it. Hmm. Um, it may be a bit of a touchy question, but did you did, did you have issues in your in your education training with with discrimination or anything along that lines? Thankfully, I did not have any super major issues. Mm. I've had a couple of instances surrounding like field housing and not really feeling welcomed in like an area where I could live. So I commute to my field site every day instead of like living on site. Mm -hmm. So it's just like different little things like that. What can what can our listeners help with? What could you what could we do to make this better as allies or as uh, fellow scientists? Well, one thing you can do is check on your scientist friends, like be that helpful contact for them to say, hey, I made it here safely or I made it back home safely yeah. or just like watch out for them and even accompany them if you're allowed to, or if you have the time, hmm. that's really a extremely helpful thing for people. I can't imagine. I can't imagine just the, like that's a possibility of where you go and you may not make it back. Um, I don't know. So, I'm just, I don't know what to say. That's just, I'm just so, <laughs> I just feel so bad that that's a thing. Yes. And I started my field research in 2020 so it was just the huge year of political unrest mm. plus pandemic rules made it so that I couldn't have any assistance. I had to work by myself. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little bit scary working in this like rural, predominantly white area alone, sometimes at night. Hmm. Hmm. And, and do, do your friends check in on you? Do you have somebody yourself, Murray? Yes, I have an amazing support network full oh, of family and friends looking out for me. Oh, that's good. Well, you also have Loki. I do. <laughs> <laughs> that That's his real job, security dog, since he's yeah. a terrible field technician. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, Bunsen would run security for you if you needed him. He would. Uh, he's super big <laughs> and he's very friendly, but, you know, any giant dog um looks terrifying yes. you just don't know if they'll just you know if you mess with somebody they'll just take your face off or something so <laughs> absolutely yes he, he looks like a scary pit bull even though he's a teddy bear <laughs> oh. um i would not use beaker for any level of security because she would love everybody equally no matter what <laughs> if somebody broke into our house she'd be like oh boy visitors hey <laughs> so glad you're here um, let me show you where they keep all their valuables. Like she'd be just awful. <laughs> Johnny oh, Bacon. <laughs> I love dogs like that. <laughs> it's the word. It's 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 adorable because she loves everybody with like the force of a thousand hurricanes. But I know she's a terrible guard guard dog. She'd just be awful. So, anyways, is there any other suggestions you could you could give to us uh, to help out? Um. Our, our colleagues in science that might need some support. Yeah. So one thing I've done recently is me, along with one of my friends, started a nonprofit organization called Field Inclusive. Mm -hmm. And its goal is to help um, Black and historically excluded field workers through recognition, finance, and safety support. And one of the goals that we wanted to do through our safety support is partner with universities and other natural science organizations to help them put policies in place that protect their employees and students. Hmm. Because I would imagine that if the university governing body is made up of people who have never faced discrimination, they would never know this is even an issue. Exactly. A lot of people don't think about field safety in that way. Hmm. So you would, 
this would be an, like awareness and saying, hey, if you have a field worker, there should be some steps you should you go through to keep them safe. Um, is Am I getting on the right track? Yes, awareness, but also like actual trainings to go through and like policies that are in place, like make sure stuff is written down and that you have an actual plan to address um, any potential issues. Okay, so instead of it just being verbal, it's on the books as some, you know, like it's an actual rule that the university follows or a series of guidelines. Right, and that helps protect the employee or student as well so that everything isn't on their shoulders to keep themselves safe without any support from their network. Wonderful. Um, is that, is there a Twitter account for that or is there a website for that organization or that nonprofit that you've started? There is. Um, our Twitter handle is just at field inclusive, no spaces. And our website is launching soon. We're still working on it. We're we're very much brand new. We launched like a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> oh, oh, you're brand new. Okay, I found it on Twitter. Field in at field inclusive. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so we'll make sure that a link to this is in the show notes to this interview. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, we're at the end of our chat. Murray, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us on the Science Podcast about your research with barn swallows, um, sharing your adorable story about Loki, kind of melting my brain about bird diabetes. Um, I really enjoyed having you as a guest. Yeah, thank you so much. I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for having me. Sweet. Um, and Murray, do you have a Twitter account or social media presence or website? I have all of those things. Um, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Murray Lou B, M U R R Y L O U B. And my website is mlburgess.org. Okay. We will make sure we'll have some of those links um, in the show notes as well. So, folks, you can just check out uh, the show notes on your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much. Okay. It's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. I will start. We have a new update on the Bunsen scenario. He is no longer poop infested. He smells <laughs> nice. He smells clean because dad gave him a bath. Bunsen, if you didn't know, hates baths. If yes. No, if by dad you mean mom. No, mom, mom washed Bunsen. I wasn't there for the bath. I got him into the bath. Dad has to get him into the bath and then mom washes him. But Bunsen is now clean. Um, and I can pet him now because before he reeked. Um, <laughs> but yeah, now he's nice and clean and happy and cute. And I was like, I really want to pet you, but you smell like literal poop. So maybe I don't do that. Um but yeah, he's clean now and he's happy about being clean, but he hates baths. He will not do baths. And then after a bath or after he gets wet, he gets mad at dad all day. <laughs> the rest of the day, he gets mad at dad. <laughs> I am the only one that, well, you're probably strong enough now to lift him into the bath. But for the longest time, I was the only one who could get him into the bathtub. So he associated getting wet and being bathed with me. <laughs> Yeah, and then when we went out to the sea one day and he fell out of the kayak that was when his fault. he was with me, he got mad at you as soon as we got to shore. He got so <laughs> angry. Um, but yeah, he is now clean and I hope he doesn't go and poop again because that would be short-lived about him being clean. Uh, Dad, do you have a story? Yeah, I've got two short stories. Um, one is I was reflecting a couple days ago about uh, Beaker. And I've been saying this thing, this thing lately that we don't give Beaker enough credit. Um, and I was just reflecting that, you know, we, we look at her as this, we still call her the baby dog or baby girl or little girl. Like we still think of her as a baby. Um, I don't know why she's two. Maybe she'll always be our baby because when we got her, she was so tiny. Um, but she is, we just don't give her enough credit. She's really smart. Um, she's, she is uh, so cuddly. Like she's doing this thing now with everybody where she comes and just, 
she'll just cuddle with you on the couch for as long as you're on the couch. Um, and I'll tell you that really changes your day. It doesn't matter if I've had a, if anybody's had a good or bad day, but if you have a dog cuddle with you, um, <laughs> it makes your day way better. And I think Bunsen's just too big and he gets too hot from cuddling. So any of his cuddle time is really short lived. He might cuddle a little bit longer with Chris. Um, and the other thing is that like, uh, like when like Beaker is just different than Bunsen and we just don't give her enough credit for what she's really good at. Um, she's starting to listen outside on re recall off leash. Like I thought we would always have to click her up on the way back into the house because she would not really want to come in after being on an off leash walk. She would stay next to everybody. Like it wasn't like she would run away. Um, but now nearly, I'd say we're at a hundred percent with her, um, coming into the house when called like to come back and that's that's really heartwarming. So we don't give her enough credit. She's not. It's, it's fairly significant, Jason. Yeah. Um, because what she used to do was go hide in the willow tree and you can't get her in there. No, no. When she was like one, she would go in the willow tree to, I don't know, try to get birds. And it was I, I don't know, but you can't get out. You can't get in there. And she's like, <laughs> ha ha, you can't get me. I can't. Yeah. I'm not coming out. And you I was can't just reflecting me. on that she's. Like she is, she is chaotic and she's got lots of energy, but she's a really good dog. She's oh, a really 100%. good dog. She's a, such a little good, she's, I always call her my little good girl. Yeah. We just don't give her enough credit. I think you don't give her enough credit. Although well, I, I am reaping the benefits of her better recall. Um, mm -hmm. Because like even today I had both dogs and I said, okay, we're going to go in the garage. And she looked and she's like, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. going to go in the garage. And I, I really appreciate her listening to me. Yeah. Um, because you know, you're, you're definitely more commanding and I'm definitely more, um, the pushover, but that's just hope for everybody out there. Like I worked and I worked at her recall and I don't know, maybe it, she just had, she, she decided it was okay. I don't know, but it's like, that's really, it's good for us that her recall is so good now. Anyways, yeah, hundred percent. All right, mom, do you have a story? I sure do. It's Spooktober, which means that we dress up the dogs in Halloween costumes. And this past week, I made a ghost costume for Bunsen, and he is a happy ghost. <laughs> he is so happy in He's his ghost so costume. so happy to be a ghost. And then yesterday, we set up Beaker and hers, and less happy faces were coming from her. Um, yeah, definite RBF resting Beaker face was showing up. Yeah, the RBF. And that's actually my story from this week. It has been a busy week. Very busy week coming. All right. So that is the end of story time with me, Adam. Um, thank you so much for listening to this uh, week's podcast. And I'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye-bye. That's it for another Science Podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to us. Special thanks to our guest, Murray Burgess, and also a special guest to our top tier Paw Pack members on the Paw Pack Plus. Take it away, Chris. Elizabeth Bourgeois, Peggy McKeel, Mary La Magna Writer, Helen Chin, Holly Burge, Sandy Brimer, Brenda Clark, Andrew Lynn, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, Catherine Jordan, Tracy Domingu, Diane Allen, Julie Smith, Terry Adam, Shelley Smith, Jennifer Smathers, Laura Stephenson, Tracy Leanbaugh, Courtney Proven, Fun Lisa, Ben Rathert, Jody Ogren, Brianne Haas, Bianca Hyde, Debbie Anderson, Anne Uchida, Donna Craig, Amy C., Susan Wagner, Kathy Zerker, and Liz Button. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh -huh.